Hey, welcome to the seventh episode of Marks and Chill. We are still reading the economic and philosophic manuscripts of 1844. Today's chapter discusses private property and communism. Finally, I feel like we've arrived. <laughs> and if this is your first time on my channel, make sure you check out the playlist for Marks and Chill so that you're all caught up. Because of course, this video is going to make a lot more sense if you have seen the six previous episodes. And just to let you know, I have slightly changed my filming setup. So I'm going to be looking at my computer, which is over here, which you cannot see. So that's why I'm looking off into the distance. The opposing nature between a lack of property and property, as long as it's not understood as the opposing nature of capital and labor, is not yet seen for the contradiction that exists in their active connection or internal relation. So the nature of lack of property versus having private property is the relationship between labor and capital. Labor, the essence of private property as exclusion of property, and capital, objective labor as exclusion of labor, make up private property as its developed state of contradiction, hence a dynamic relationship. Private property is first only considered only in its objective aspect with labor as its essence, its form of essence, it's therefore capital, or a particular form of labor, broken down, fragmented, and therefore unfree. Labor is seen as private property's harmful nature, and of its existence in estrangement from humans. Finally, communism is the positive expression of an old private property, at first as universal private property. So if we can have a positive expression of getting rid of private property, we can also have a negative expression of that but we're clarifying that communism is the positive form of getting rid of private property and by embracing this relation as a whole of capital and labor being what makes up private property communism is in its first form only a generalized and consumption of the relation on the one hand it is dominion over vast material property it wants to disregard talent the purpose of life and existence is direct physical possession. The category of the worker is extended to all humans, and the relationship of private property exists as a relation of the community to the world of things. Finally, this movement of opposing universal private property to private property finds expression in the brutish form of opposing to marriage, which is a form of exclusive private property, the community of women in which a woman becomes a piece of communal and common property. Just as a woman passes from marriage to general prostitution, prostitution which is only a specific expression of the general prostitution of the worker, a relationship which, by the way, falls not only on the worker, but on the one that prostitutes as well, meaning the capitalist, who, in Marx's eyes, is the bigger abomination of the two. So the entire world of wealth passes from the relationship of exclusive marriage with the owner of private property, to a state of universal prostitution with the community. This type of communism, since it negates the personality of humans, is the negation of private property, general envy constituting itself only in another way. The thought of every piece of private property as such is at least turned against wealthier private property in the form of envy and the urge to reduce things to a common level, so that this envy and urge even constitute the essence of competition. Crude communism is the culmination of this envy and of the leveling down from the preconceived minimum. It has a definite limited standard. This annulment of private property is an appropriation, a regression to the unnatural simplicity of the poor and crude person who has few needs and has not even reached private property, let alone gone beyond it. So in this first point, Marx is talking about the first stage of communism, which is gonna be like very harsh. It of course wants to amass everything for the benefit of, you know, everyone. Isn't that just kind of like the opposite of the greed of capitalism, whereas the greed of capitalism is on an individual scale? The community is not only a community of labor and equal wages paid by communal capital, by the community as the universal capitalist, both sides of this relationship are raised to an imagined universality, labor as the category in which every person is placed, and capital as the acknowledged universality and power of the community. In the approach to woman as the object of communal lust is expressed the infinite degradation which humans exist for themselves. Now, for this part, 
Marx keeps talking about the relationship between men and women. And I always try to avoid referring to a specific gender because I understand there's a spectrum of genders. But for this particular section, I'm going to keep referring to men and women. If I'm constantly saying like they're relating to themselves, relating to themselves, like it's going to make no sense. But I don't mean at all to not be inclusive in this part. The relationship between men and women is natural and is the relation of person to person. Just like a man's relation to nature is immediately his relation to himself. This relation reflects the extent to which the human essence has become nature to man, or which nature to him has become human essence. You can judge a person's whole level of development from this relationship to nature. And from the character of this relationship follows how much a man, as a human species, has come to be himself and understands themselves. Therefore, the relationship from man to woman is the most natural relation of human being to human being. This relation also reveals the extent to which man's need has become a human need. The other person is a need for him. The extent to which he in his individual existence is at the same time a social being. So basically what I understand from this part is that how a man treats nature is how he treats himself. And in a similar way, how he's going to treat a woman is how he treats themselves. So if a man sees a woman as an object, it is because he sees himself as an object and nature as an object because he has been alienated through the process of labor. And of course, I'm sure back then the relationship to men and women was even more sexist and misogynist, therefore needed to be made clear why a man might treat a woman like an object. The first positive annulment of private property is thus merely one form in which the vileness of private property disguised as positive community system comes to the surface. The second type of communism will be communism still political in nature, whether democratic or despotic, with the abolition of the state yet still incomplete and being still affected by private property and the estrangement of humans. The interesting part right here for me being that Marx says you can have communism that is despotic, like authoritarian, but you could also have a communism that is democratic. Both forms of communism are aware of the reintegration of humans, the transcendence of their own self-estrangement, but since it has not yet grasped the positive essence of private property nor the human nature of need, it remains infected by them. It does not capture the essence. So I guess he's saying that in order to have a communism that works, we need to acknowledge that there is a positive side to private property and that there is a validity to human need. And until you acknowledge those two things and not just their negatives, you cannot transcend them. Now the third form of communism is communism as the positive transcendence of private property and human self-estrangement and therefore the real appropriation of human essence. Communism is the complete return of humans to themselves as a social being accomplished consciously and embracing the entire wealth of the previous development. This communism is the genuine resolution of the conflict between human and nature between people. The true resolution of war between existing and essence, between objectification and self-confirmation, between freedom and necessity, between the individual and the species. Communism is the solution of the riddle of history. So he's saying there is a communism that can acknowledge that we have developed as a human species and have progressed in humanity, but that will also take us beyond private property and will also acknowledge your humanity and liberate you from your estrangement. So let's talk a little bit about that. The entire movement of history is understood and known by the process of becoming. Whereas the still immature communism seeks historical proof for itself in what already exists, through disconnected historical moments that oppose private property, but by proving that it existed in, in itself refutes its claim as real. Like people are always saying, communism has never worked. History has proven that communism will never work. Um, and what he's saying is like, well, we're looking at moments in history that have nothing to do with each other. Maybe we just haven't arrived at a real communism that works. And if we keep looking into the past instead of looking at how to create one in the future, of course we're going to continue thinking that communism doesn't work. 
The entire revolutionary movement finds its basis in the movement of private property or more specifically in the economy. This material private property is the perceptible expression of a strange human nature. This material private property is the perceptible expression of the estrangement of human life. Its movement, the production and consumption, is the perceptible relation of the movement of all production until now, or the reality of humans. The positive transcendence of private property as the appropriation of human life is the positive transcendence of all estrangement. The return of man from religion, family, state, to his human social existence. A religious estrangement occurs in one's consciousness, but economic estrangement is that of real life. Therefore, economic estrangement embraces both aspects, real life and your mind. It is evident that the initial stage of the movement depends on the recognized life of other people manifesting itself more in its consciousness or in the external world. According to Marx, communism begins from the outset with atheism. Based on the assumption of private annulled private property, human produces human, themselves and another person, how the object, being direct manifestation of their individuality, is their own existence for the other person, and that existence of the other person for that of them. Now, the material of labor, human as subject, and the historical necessity of private property are all the point of departure. Thus, the social character is the general character of the whole movement. Just as society itself produces human as a human, so is society produced by them. Activity and enjoyment are social. The human aspect of nature exists only for social human. For only then does nature exist for them as a bond with human. Nature and humans both exist for the other, which is the life element of human reality. Only then does nature exist as the foundation of human existence. Only then has what is to them a natural existence become a human existence and nature becomes human for them. Thus, society is a complete union of humans and nature. Although communal activity and enjoyment happen when around expression of sociability stems from the true character of the activity's contentment and enjoyableness. Now, what makes an activity social and enjoyable? Well, that it's a communal activity and that there is joy in it. And joy happens if the activity in itself has redeemable qualities but also when i'm being scientifically active something i rarely do with others which means that my activity is social because i perform it as a human not only is the material of my activity given to me as a social product even if it's just language for example with which the thinker is active my own existence is social activity and therefore that which i make for myself i make for society and with the consciousness of myself as a social being. My general consciousness is only the theoretical abstraction of real life, therefore the activity of my general consciousness is also my theoretical existence as a social being. We must avoid representing society as an abstraction of the individual. The individual is the social being. Their manifestations of life are the expressions and confirmation of their social life. The individual's existence is a more specific or general mode of the life of the species, just as the life of the species is a more specific or general individual life. In their consciousness of species, humans confirm their social life and simply repeats their existence in their thoughts. Therefore, as much as the individual is a specific individual, they're just as much the totality as the existence of imagined and experienced society for itself. Thinking and being as definitely distinct, but at the same time, they're in unity with each other. Now, what this reminds me of is a phenomenon that happens in Latin American literature. If you read a story in Latin American literature, you can safely assume that that's a story not just happening to an individual, but happening to a nation or, or a society. Now, contrast that to English literature. If I read The Catcher in the Rye, I'm not supposed to think that that's going on on a societal level. I'm supposed to think that that's just an individual story. And of course, we're talking about literature, but Marx is saying, when you look at the human species, to look at an individual is to look at the entire society. Because we all create society, like all of our efforts put together create society, and society is reflecting us back to ourselves. And we are reflecting society back in our minds, and we are creating stuff back to society. And so it's like, they're both a mirror of one another. So you can't just look at an individual 
and expect it to function differently than society is functioning. So kind of like if at an individual level people are suffering, then you're safe to assume the society is suffering. Now, just as private property is the proof that humans become an object and that the manifestation of their lives is alienation and this realization is a loss of reality, the positive transcendence of private property is the appropriation of and by humans of human essence, life and achievements, and not the immediate one-sided enjoyment of merely having or possessing. So it's really interesting, private property being human essence, achievements, life, not just having stuff. Humans appropriate their total essence with each of their relations to the world. Seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling, thinking, observing, experiencing, wanting, acting, loving. All the organs of their individual beings are directly social and objective appropriation of human reality. Private property has made us so stupid that it is only when an object is ours that it exists for us as capital or when it's possessed, eaten, drink, drunk, worn, inhabited, when it is used by us. All the private property sees these possessions only as a means to life, and the life they serve is the life of private property of labor and conversion into capital. So by giving into the idea of private property, we also buy into a life that is all about working and creating money. Because in order for you to have things, well, you have to work and or somehow make money so that becomes your life your life becomes making money working so you can have things he's saying isn't there more to life than having instead of all physical and mental senses a sense of alienation has replaced them through a sense of having the human being was reduced to absolute poverty so that they may bring their inner wealth to the outer world so Wealth is like a cheap replacement of human existence. The transcendence of private property is therefore the complete emancipation of all human senses and qualities. All senses and attributes have basically been put to use for human use as opposed to enjoyment. And I, yeah, I totally agree with that. Like, how many of us walk down the street and we don't even enjoy our sense of sight, smell, we don't take our time enjoying our walk. We're just like going somewhere. We have somewhere to go, somewhere to be. We gotta go work. We gotta go make money. We're taking a break from work. We actually don't enjoy ourselves. And as humans, we enjoy ourselves through our senses. In the same way that the enjoyment of other humans has become our own appropriation, associating with others has become an expression of your own life. And that reminds me of like, yeah, so many people have made their connections, their friendships, like, a way to climb social ladders, a way to a way to make a personal statement about who they are rather than having genuine connections. And on the other hand, it is only when humans perceive the world through their senses that all the objects become for the individual an objectification of themselves. The way in which they become their objects depends on the nature of the object and its essential power. And this relationship determines how we perceive them. So Marx goes on to say essential powers a lot and what I get is just it means senses. Like the essential power of your eye is sight. Now to the eye, an object is something other than to the ear. And an object of the eye is something else than the object of the ear. Thus, humans are affirmed in the world not just through their thinking but through their senses. Now, on the other hand, let's see this on a more subjective level. Music might awaken in the individual the sense of music, but at the same time, the most beautiful music makes no sense for somebody that doesn't have a musical ear. Therefore, my object can be only the confirmation of my own senses or my essential powers. Now, only through the richness of a person's essential being is human sensibility cultivated or brought into form. For not only the five senses, but also mental, practical, human nature of the senses come to be by virtue of its object or by virtue of the humanized nature. The forming of the five senses is a labor of the entire history of the world. The sense caught up in a practical need is a restricted sense. For the starving person, for example, they are not gonna enjoy eating a meal. They're just eating to survive. Making the feeding activity no different than animals. The burden, poverty-stricken person has no sense for a fine play. The dealer of minerals sees only commercial value and not the beauty of the mineral. Thus, 
The objectification of human essence is required to make an individual senses human, as well as to create the human sense corresponding to the entire wealth of human and natural substance. So, yeah, so not only do we have senses that can capture amazing, beautiful things, but also through labor and just human life, we're objectifying our own senses, therefore we're not capturing this, all these other beautiful things. We're kind of like making them more utilitarian. Which in and of itself is another form of alienation. Now through the movement of private property, the society finds all the materials of its development. All of its wealth and its misery. And the established society produces a rich individual endowed with all the senses as its enduring reality. We see how subjectivism and objectivism now subjectivism means the truth resides in your mind so you can have a different truth than i can while objectivism says truth exists in knowledge so subjectivism versus objectivism spiritualism versus materialism activity and suffering they lose their opposing characters only within the framework of society we see how the history of industry and the established objective existence of industry are the result of human essential powers, their senses, and human psychology, but only in an external relation to utility, because while being alienated, humans can only think of their general mode of being as politics, art, literature, etc., as opposed to more abstract forms like religion or history, and as a reality of human's existence and our activity as species. So we have before us the objectified senses of humans as a form of sensuous, alien, useful objects, in the form of estrangement displayed in ordinary material industry. Since all human activity has been labor, that is, industry, it is activity estranged from itself. Now for this part, Marx starts to talk about psychology. Psychology cannot become a genuine, comprehensive real science as long as it doesn't examine this part of history which is the most perceptible and accessible. What are we to think of a science that doesn't closely examine this large part of human labor, which boils down all of human endeavor and labor down to a need or a vulgar need? And that's actually true, like, like when we look at human history, we never talk about labor like work. The human sciences have developed an enormous activity and have accumulated an ever-growing mass of material. Philosophy, however, remains just as alien to the sciences as they remain to philosophy. Their momentary unity was just an illusion. Historiography pays little regard to natural science as a factor of alignment, utility, and some other special discoveries. But the natural sciences have invaded and transformed human life all the more practically through industry and has prepared human emancipation, although its immediate effect has been the dehumanization of people. Industry is the actual historical relationship of nature and therefore natural science to the individual. If industry is understood as the revelation of human senses, we also gain an understanding of the human essence of nature or the natural essence of humans. It is a lie to assume one basis for human life and another basis for science. The nature which develops in human history is human's real nature, hence nature as it develops through industry, even though it is an estranged form, it is true anthropological nature. Sense perception must be the basis of all science. Only when it proceeds from the sense perception of both the sensuous consciousness and the sensuous need, it is true science. Sensuous meaning of the senses. I'm, gonna, I'm about to say it a lot. <laughs> All of history is the history of preparing and developing the human to become the object of sensuous consciousness and turning the requirements of being alive into our needs. History itself is a part of natural history, of nature developing into human. Natural science will in time incorporate itself as a real part of natural history. Humans are the object of natural science for immediate sensuous nature, for human is immediately human sensuousness. Human senses can only find their self understanding in the science of the natural world in general, just as they can find your objective realization only in natural objects. The element of thought is language, which is one of sensuous nature. The social reality of nature and the human natural science, or the natural science of humans, are identical terms. It will be seen how in place of the wealth and poverty of capitalism comes the rich human being and the rich human need. The rich human is simultaneously the human being in need of a totality of human's manifestations of life, the person whose own realization exists as a need. Likewise, poverty of the individual 
is the passive bond which causes people to experience the need of the greatest wealth, the need of another human being. The sensuous outburst of my life activity is passion, which thus becomes the activity of my being. Well, I never thought about this, but yeah, it is really weird that we study human history separate from nature when they're actually, of course, happening together at the same time as a result of one another. A being only considers themselves independent when they stand on their own feet. But they only stand on their own feet if they owe their existence to themselves. A person who lives by the grace of another sees themselves as dependent. But I live completely by the grace of another if I owe them not only the maintenance of my life, but if they have created my life. When it isn't my creation, my life has a source outside of it. The creation is therefore an idea that is difficult to eliminate from popular consciousness. The fact that humans and nature exist of their own account is incomprehensible because it contradicts everything tangible in private life. It is the mating of two people that creates a human. Like a circular movement, humans repeat themselves in procreation, always remaining the subject. Who created the first human and nature as a whole? That question is a product of abstraction. You see them as separate from one another or as if they didn't exist. Either give up that question or see yourself as non-existence because you too are human and nature. But since for the socialist person, the entire so-called history of the world is nothing but the creation of human through labor, nothing but the emergence of nature for humans, so they think they have proof of their birth or their genesis. Since the real existence of human and nature has become evident in practice through sense experience. Because humans have become evident as the being of nature and nature as the being of humans, the question about an alien being, a being above nature and men, is the question that implies admitting the inexistence of nature in humans and has become impossible. Atheism as the denial of this reality that doesn't exist no longer has any meaning. But socialism no longer stands in need of such understanding. It proceeds from theoretically and practically sensuous consciousness of man, of nature, as the essence. Socialism is human's positive self-consciousness, no longer argued through the abolition of religion, just as the real life is human's positive reality is no longer argued through the abolition of private property through communism. Communism is a positive move of the negation and thus the actual phase necessary for the next stage of historical development in the process of human emancipation and rehabilitation. But communism as such is not the goal of human development. I didn't know what this meant so I looked at the footnotes and it says this statement is interpreted differently by researchers. Many of them maintain that Marx here meant crude equalitarian communism. While recognizing the historic role of that communism, he thought it impossible to ignore its weak points. It seems more justifiable, however, to interpret this passage proceeding from the peculiarity of terms used in the manuscript. Marx here used the term communism to mean not the higher face of classless society, which at the time he denoted socialism or communism equaling humanism, but movement in various forms including primitive forms of equalitarian communism at the early stage, directed at its achievement, a revolutionary transformational process of transition. Marx emphasized that this process should not be considered an end to itself, but that it is a necessary though a transitional stage in attaining future social systems, which will be characterized by the new features distinct from those proper to this stage. So it's very interesting. So communism is never meant to be the end point of everything. It's just a transitional stage until we as a society figure out how to create a new system that is more just and does not alienate every single person, basically. <laughs> and our next text will also be about communism, so I'm sure we will expand on these ideas. But that's really all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching if you still are. Subscribe if you'd like to continue talking about world domination. And I'm really sorry it took me so long to make this video. I actually had to shoot this video twice, both the voice part and the painting part. It was just a journey making this video. <laughs> So I'm sorry if any of you are waiting. I'm starting to see comments of some of you that are watching using this for your classes Which I can't even believe it never really occurred to me that somebody like in college would be using my videos for their classes Anyway, I guess the point I'm trying to say is like I'm sorry if you're like waiting for my video and It just takes long. But anyway, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one